So what I want to talk today about is, as it says, uh, preparing for Industry 4.0. And I think that there's been a lot of discussion about the future of work and how we're facing a, if you will, disruptive new, brave new kind of employment world, right? I think we all know that there is a change coming. So the question is, what is this and how can we prepare for it? And how can we do so in a way that is empowering as opposed to merely disruptive? So I wanted to start with a couple cartoons that I think actually uh, help center some of our discussion today. So the first is one um, in the New Yorker, and <laughs> it's got a man looking at a wheel, and then his wife says, Ryan's a late adopter. Right? Now, I put this up because of the fact that there really is a sense in which we are facing new technologies. We are on the verge of having a whole range of novel things that are connected to our digital realities, to connected to virtual realities, connected to the internet of everything, that will really change, again, how we live, how we work, even how we think. However, I also put this up because there's a, there's a kind of funny part here, which is the fact that there's a real fear. There's a fear that if we don't adopt, we'll become extinct. There's a fear of being left behind. And there's a discourse around the kind of inevitability of this, as if if we don't capture this technological wave, we're going to be similar to people who didn't take advantage of the wheel. And I think we all know uh, from recent experience what happens when you have discourses of people feeling left behind in the face of ideologies which can feel inevitable and unchangeable. But I have a second one that I think maybe is a little more uh, focused on business, which is someone presenting to a boardroom and says, but what if consumers aren't looking for a disruptive, synergized paradigm shift in a breath mint? <laughs> right? Now, I put this up because of the fact that it's also about knowing what we want and knowing when this is appropriate. And when we're using these kind of cliches, disruptive technology, paradigm shift, right? What are we actually trying to achieve? Who are we actually trying to serve? Who are our stakeholders? Right? And what do they want? And, um, I mean, I personally don't need my breathman to be that high tech. So. so I want to start just with a question of what is the fourth industrial revolution? So there's a kind of famous, and by famous, I mean uh, about you know, 70,000 people have probably read it and appreciated it. Uh, there's probably YouTube uh, things of cats playing that have more views of this. But nevertheless, uh, famous in our world of Klaus Schwab, who said that while previous industrial revolutions liberated humankind from animal power, made mass production possible, and brought digital capabilities to billions of people. This fourth industrial revolution is, however, fundamentally different. It is characterized by a range of new technologies that are fusing the physical, digital, and biological world, impacting all disciplines, economies, and industries, and even challenging ideas about what it means to be human. So let's unpack this for a second. Right? What he is saying is that previous revolutions, right? They were, in many ways, changes to how we produce things, changes to how we labored, OK? They weren't necessarily existential changes, right? The movement, for instance, from a slave to a feudal to an industrial uh, exploitive capitalist economy, right, had mass differences, yet at the same time, it didn't necessarily change the ways in which we experienced our physical world or who we were as humans. Now, there's a lot of debate about this. But one of the things that is coming on now is that what this will be is not just something that makes it you know, easier to produce things. It's not just something that is going to change again how we go to work or how we profit, or even if there will be employment in a profit-based economy. It's going to change how we see the world, how we live in our realities, and even how we consider ourselves as humans. So this is a revolution, supposedly, 
that is much more widespread and fundamental and existential than what has come previously. So they call it the fourth industrial revolution because it does follow a certain historical trajectory. Um, one is the move from water and steam. Two is one from electricity. Three is around automation. Okay. And four are cyber physical systems. Okay. So you have the movement of the replacement of a complete loom, right? So using water and steam. And I always used to do this when um, I had my, uh, when I used to teach economics to uh, my students. Uh, one of the most interesting, uh, well, interesting if you're me, um, times <laughs> is actually when you think of medieval periods, right, or what we call the medieval period, we think, oh, what a backward age. But actually, it was an incredible age of technological innovation and change, right? In many ways, one that is much more similar to what is happening now in certain senses than the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, right? Um, because you're talking about fundamental changes based on technology to what could be produced, how things could be produced, and the ways in which people produce things. The second is electricity. Um, and in this kind of sense, there was little replacement uh, as tool and equipment could be kept, but you did need things like conveyor belts. Then you have automation. So we talk a lot about automation, but as many of you know, we actually have quite a bit of automation already. Um, and now we're moving towards, again, cyber physical systems, where machines are connected. And we're going to be, in many ways, partially replacing equipment. But it's more about repurposing that equipment. So in kind of bottom line terms, what does this mean? Well, by 2020, there's going to see that 4 billion people are going to be connected. There's going to be $4 trillion in revenue opportunity. There's going to be over 25 million apps. We're going to have almost 25 billion embedded intelligent systems and almost 50 trillion GBs of data. Okay. Now this sounds, uh, well, I mean, it sounds impressive, I think. But I want to stop here for a second because this is often where we end. But there's something even more exciting. So I have a, a one and a half year old son, okay? Let me tell you two things that are important. The only thing that will probably be irrelevant here uh, is this. Because while we talk often about the revenue opportunities and the profitability, what all this speaks to is the fact that this, the four trillion in revenue, is not gonna matter because we're no longer gonna be living in a profit-based economy. We're already finding something that is massively changing. And this is one of the most difficult things for us to, to fully, because our vocabulary doesn't even always have it, which is the fact that we have to find ways to profit now. They're not obvious. We have to think about introducing profit, introducing private property, introducing competition to a world when they're quickly becoming outdated. So let me ask a question, and it's all right because uh, I, I haven't gone to that many. Has anyone gone to a hackathon? No? OK. So a hackathon is, is this really kind of interesting thing that people kind of do on Fridays and Saturdays, where essentially you get a, a range of people like ourselves together. We have some interesting ideas for digital technology. And they're about creating services for people. OK? So it can be a whole range of things, right? Uh, so it can be very social entrepreneurship, like we're going to create a website so people can do wage checks to make sure they're being paid a minimum wage. It can be even something more directly kind of service-oriented or profit-oriented, which is we're going to help create uh, algorithms that actually allow people to check that they're getting the best deal um, on their flights. Okay. Now, what I find interesting about this is that I I've been to, to, to many. And I came as someone who was not necessarily uh, you know, a technologist, but I, I'm an economist. And what I discovered was a shift. 15 years ago, the business plan was obvious. You had to refine it. But the technology wasn't. Now, when you go to these, they're two days long. 
you spend maybe an hour and a half talking about the technology. Technology is easy, right? You spend a day and a half trying to figure out how to profit off this when there's no need to. Because at this point, things are common, they're shared, right? There's ways in which actually, <laughs> right, our marginal costs are so small with these. What you find is ways in which they spend a lot of time saying, well, how do we figure out how to have a competitive advantage? When all you should be talking about is, well, this shows we have a collaborative advantage. And I bring this up because when we're seeing this, we're talking about, again, something much larger. And we're still figuring it out, right? So what do we mean when we do say this? So what is actually happening? Well, there's four particular types of technologies that are associated with the fourth industrial revolution. Artificial intelligence, robotics, big data, and the internet of everything. Um, so let's go through these one by one and see how we can prepare for this revolution. Um, and I promise you uh, there'll be as few guillotines as possible. So when we talk about this, there is a certain aspect about technological adaptation. And some of this will probably be very familiar to people who've done an MBA, as we all have, or is interested in general about these. So in this sense, when we talk about technological ad adaptation, there's, there's a little bit of a wave, right? Um, so you start with innovators. These are often people who have the ability to take risks and are more prosperous. Then you move to early adopters, people who are more forward thinking or more willing to take and try new things or more able. Then you have an early majority, people who aren't necessarily wanting to always be on the quote cutting edge, but then when they do see a trend are wanting to take advantage of it. Then a kind of late majority, okay, we're all using this. Um, and then laggards, which are people who refuse to use this, right? Um, I kind of, uh, you know, used this with my dad, who when we first told him he could buy things online, he said, I don't want to do that. Then he saw some of his friends doing it, um, and he thought, well, okay, I could maybe do that. Then he became the early majority. Now he sees everyone in his neighborhood doing it, and my dad can handle eBay and negotiate on eBay better than anyone I've ever seen. In two years, he's become an expert. Um, but he still has like two or three friends in his community that just refuse to have anything to do with it. But it's also important to understand the difference between disruptive technology here and disruptive innovation. That does anyone know what the biggest company in the world is right now? Apple. So this is always a fun thing. Apple has to be really innovative, right? Can anyone tell us how Apple became so big? And I'll, I'll give you a hint. Apple nor Google has ever invented any technology. All the technology that's ever really been invented has been made by us. In fact, it's been made by the US, UK, Indian, and Chinese governments, and then been refined by South Koreans. This is true. Private industry rarely discovers anything. Not because they're bad or whatever, because it requires long-term investment, <laughs> which, you know, as all of you who've probably looked at quarterly reports knows, is very hard to justify and do. He figured something out in his garage, with Steve Wilsnick, what Steve Wilsnick wanted to democratize the internet, wanted to democratize tech technology, he looked at it and said, I have a better idea. What if we created a business plan where we can convince people to buy the same thing year after year, but more expensively? And everyone looked at him and said, that's crazy. If someone buys a phone, they're not going to buy another phone next year. Why would they? And he said, what if we convince them to do so. And that's a disruptive innovation that Apple created. They didn't create any technology behind all their design things, nothing except for the fact that they created a business plan that asked us to buy the same thing essentially year after year after year with only minor modifications, and that is the integration part, for more money. So when we're talking about this, it's important to understand the difference between innovation and technology. 
So innovation is that which changes a marketplace. Technology is that which, if you can be, transforms the marketplace. So the movement from technology to type, from typewriter to computer, that is a disruptive technology. Okay. So we are talking about then a mixture between disruptive technologies and disruptive innovations. Okay. So the first thing in terms of preparing is thinking about how we scale up human-centered technology. Already understanding what exists in terms of our own kind of technological expertise and seeing how we scale that up. Then it's leading continuous reinvention. Now, this is from the World Economic Forum, and we're going to kind of deconstruct this in a second because they have a very clear and obvious agenda. But it's interesting as a basis and foundation. Third is creating sustainable systems. And four is responding to geoeconomic shifts. So let's look at those a little bit in turn. Um, so again, we talked about the scaling up of the human center technology. Okay? I'll give you a, a really interesting example of that. Um, it's always funny to me that if, <laughs> if you go into a company often, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, so who here deals with operations? in a company? One. Um, do people do project lead and program management? And those are always some of my favorites because they always seem to know what's happening on the ground. Um, but you go in and the CEO will tell you, we want to transform everything. We want to change everything. We want to bring in the internet of, th of everything. And you're like, OK, well, that's things like, what do you know about it? What do you want to do? I saw it on the BBC. We're going we're gonna to become the smart organization. We're like, OK, that's great. That's fine. Let's start. So then you, know, you do your investigation. You talk to your project leaders. You talk to your marketing people. You talk to all this. And what you find out is what you really need to do is create an algorithm that's already kind of just updating what already good project leaders are doing about saying, why have four trucks go to Sheffield three times in a month when they could go one time in a month and save you quite a bit of money and also save the environment? So then you bring these together, and the CEO goes, well, that doesn't sound like Organization 4.0. <laughs> and you're kind of like, well, it is. In many ways, you know, we want you to be able to scale up your already incredible human intelligence. So a lot of what some of this is, is actually when we kind of deconstructing this and saying, what human intelligence already exists, and what ways can we use technology to enhance it, right? Um, then it is leading continuous reinvention. Now, this is something that I find interesting because within this context, it's oftentimes talked about how would you have you know, ideas of disruptive innovation? Right? How would you use kind of new technologies in order to make you more profitable or to make a new product? But I do think that we can actually use this thing about what are the ways in which we can existentially think about what kind of society we want? What kind of organization do we want? What kind of world do we want? Can we be in a process of innovate, reinvention as opposed to having it just placed upon us? Um, creating sustainable systems. I think this is really important. Um, there's a tendency to think of this as a massive process of acceleration, right? You can kind of communicate at the click of a button, right? But actually, so much of this is about taking a breath and slowing things down and seeing what is actually sustainable what actually works, what actually will be good for your organization, what will be good for your interdependencies. And it's also about seeing the ways in which some of what you're doing is not sustainable. And I think in this reflect part of like, we'll talk about but I mean, I'm going to say something relatively provocative, but maybe uh, you won't throw things at me too much because it's early in the morning. Um, but I think one of the aspects that is so Frustrating is that when you do kind of speak to a lot of policymakers or even kind of corporate leaders, they kind of take their status quo as sustainable. And you have to kind of say, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable ecologically, it's not sustainable economically, and it's certainly not sustainable socially. Right? And we see this. So we have to come up, what are sustainable systems? Right? How can we use, for instance, collaboration as opposed to competition? to create a more interdependent and innovative 
and really groundbreaking uh, economic culture, right? How can we do things like, you know, using efficiency and things like a universal basic income to actually create the types of security people can have to actually be risk takers as opposed to feeling continuously precarious? Okay. How do you have to shift from thinking about your bottom line to actually a social mission? And then responding to geoeconomic shifts, okay? Um, I don't know, does anyone watch the news or has people completely turned it off in the past year? Um, if you've turned it on a while, there, there, there has, some things have happened in the past year. Um, and I think that one of the key parts of that is understanding that things are, are moving quickly, but that at the same time, they're not inevitable, right? And that we have a real ability to not just be reactive, but actually be responsive. And I, and I want to bring up one of the points here about this, OK? Um, and again, I don't want to say anything too provocative, but I tend to think that we, we constantly say we're in a globalized world, right? Or you know, we're in a globalized economy. And yet, we haven't necessarily shifted our thinking around that. It's incredible to me, as someone who does technology studies, the fact that Americans and, I would say, Western Europeans still think of themselves as if they are the fount of technological knowledge, as if they are on the technological cutting edge, which is just simply not true. I mean, I'll give you an example. There is no city in America or Western Europe that matches, technologically speaking, Seoul in South Korea. None. I mean, if you go, like, has anyone been to these countries? Has anyone been to South Korea? One, right? I mean, Seoul is a different world. And, and it's rapidly changing. I mean, Tokyo, for instance, I'll give you an example. Tokyo has things that not only haven't we implemented in the UK, we've barely even begun to think of, right? <coughs> and this isn't to say like one is better. It is to say, though, that we have to decolonize our thinking about where innovation comes from, right? And part of this is also recognizing the power relations and things that are happening. So there is a power struggle happening right now. And I would like a different world, and it's something that we can talk about. But I mean, there is a power struggle around technology, and it is this. Right now, what's happening is both is that you have a Western uh, block that is somewhat alive between Western Europe in the United States that is trying to use traditional kind of colonial methods to exploit, uh, particularly uh, Central Africa and Northern Africa and parts of South America, right? So they're essentially saying, we're more powerful than you. You have to do what we say. And what's essentially happening, why Brexit is so interesting in a certain sense, is that Western Europe is essentially saying, we become the economic hegemon and the US becomes the military hegemon. So places like Tunisia and Northern Africa, for instance, Germany is essentially saying, we control your economy, and America saying, and we sell you the weapons. You have China, which for all of its authoritarianism internally, and it, we can talk about this externally, is giving them a different deal, saying, we are going to essentially build your infrastructure, but you have to align with us. And what they've essentially done is aligned with Russia as the American rule. So Russia says, and we'll supply the military hardware. Um, but there's one thing that neither of them are willing to do, and this is where, if you want to talk, very disruptive, is that both Western Europe and America and China and Russia don't really create a lot of technology. The two centers are essentially India and South Korea and Brazil. And what they're saying is we don't have the money or the manpower to give you, you know, infrastructure or to force you to do what we say. But what we can do is give you our technology. And so, for instance, India is doing something very interesting where they're saying, we're not going to build your trains and we're not going to come in and play economic strongmen. But what if we told you that our scientists were the ones who came up with this medicine? And yeah, we did it in America, but it's our scientists. And we actually have the technology to give it to you. So when we say geoeconomic shifts, 
I don't want to just be in cliche. I mean, these are real power struggles that are happening. And these are ones that if we don't actually rethink how we want a world, then it's ones that are going to lead to the same type of you know, traditional conquest, decline and fall of empire. But let's uh, bring this maybe down a little bit more. So for our everyday life, what type of revolution will this be? Well, for some of us, there's an idea that this could be very utopian. Okay? So it's always interesting to me that if you said to people in the 1960s, in 30 years, there'll be technology so that we won't have to have jobs or work again, everyone would have been like, that's fantastic. Now if you tell people, in 30 years, there'll be no jobs, they'll say, oh my god. Like, that's the worst thing ever. But there is a kind of recapturing of this, of why would we work 40 hours a week? Why would we work 60 hours a week? Why can't we have a technology-driven leisure society? Um, and there's a kind of new movement uh, <laughs> that I think has a really problematic name. Um, I'm not sure if it will go on a lot of banners. Fully automated luxury communism. Uh, does that make you want to go to a Sunday meeting? Um, but here it's where machines do the heavy lifting and employment as we know it is a thing of the past. Um, and I, um, I have a picture of the Jetsons, which was a really interesting. Did you get the Jetsons in the UK? Yeah. What I liked about this show and, and what I've uh, actually done a little bit of research about, you know, interesting was that you had this amazing technological society. You had a robot helping you, uh, but you still had a boss that forced you to go to work in the morning, right? <laughs> like, we also have dystopia. Um, so this is the kind of Blade Runner vision. Mass unemployment, technological totalitarianism, robots and corporations rule, right? And I think a lot of people feel this is more what's probably going to happen. Um, if you ask everyday people, like, you know, what, what do you see in 30 years? You know, don't you think society is going to make things better? And they'll say, well, I'll probably have better pictures on my phone. But yeah, we're going to be ruled by robots. But in between these, there's a lot of interesting things happening that show a middle road, or at least show a more complex picture. So um, one of them, and I, and I think in about 10 years, this is going to be a very known term, <laughs> is transhumanism. And here, this is the personal, social, political, and economic enhancement of humanity through technology. OK, so uh, uh, I do this when I give these talks. Now, this sounds very, very esoteric and big, but um, did anyone know uh, one of the biggest transhuman interventions? Well, I see some of us are transhuman right now. I am. Can you tell me how I'm transhuman? Sam's got it. Glasses. Glasses. Now, can you imagine when bifocals in essentially the 19th century became much more prominent? I mean, there's reports about it. Like, it scared people. Imagine walking around with lenses on your face, right? Um, now, I mean, uh, I, I don't think many of us uh, look at our colleagues and act like we're in the schoolyard and go four eyes, do we? It's relatively normal, right? Um, now, I bring that up because a lot of things that right now we're going to feel uncomfortable, disquieting, are actually going to become, for better and worse, more of our everyday reality. Okay. So in this respect, you know, we're going to have genetic enhancements to help us with memory, for instance. We're going to have a lot more kind of, and this is a word that right now is in science fiction, but actually is going to be much more every day, cyborg types of appendages and enhancements, right? Uh, we'll probably have a lot more biochipping to help us collect data about ourselves, right? And like all technologies, this has good and bad parts. And, and I want to say that so why we call it transhumanism, one of the leading philosophers of it had a really nice word about it, which is that technology isn't what makes us post-human or transhuman, as some writers and scholars have recently suggested. It's what makes us human. Technology is in our nature. Through our tools, we give our dreams form. We bring them into the world. The practicality of technology may distinguish it from art, but both spring from a similar, distinctly human yearning. 
And one of the interesting things is that I think it is age-old. I think it, there is a primal element to this. Um, I won't ask any more rhetorical questions, but I mean, one of the things that they're discovering that made Homo sapiens so distinct was that we have this kind of rational irrationality. Meaning, and this sounds strange, but imagine we were the only species, and this is true, that did two things. Tried to use different tools, even though we had tools that already worked. So if you look at Neanderthals, right, who were incredibly smart, they used the same tools for a thousand years, right? We didn't. <laughs> but there was even something more, which sounds to us normal today, but is actually relatively crazy. Who gets in a boat and sails when they can't see land? And there's something about that here, and I, and I really think that I know we're all in business and I know that things, but it's about not being confined to the quote unquote rational, right? It's about still having that distinctly human yearning to see if there's something over the horizon. Now, there are some ideas about a smarter, better future, um, and I would like to stress them because I think they're very important, is that one, you've probably heard a lot about universal basic income. Now, as this is promoted by people like Facebook, it's a kind of saying, we'll just give people salaries, but that's pretty much an excuse not to pay taxes and maintain public services. But there is a more comprehensive idea of, you know, we are much closer and easier to a sharing economy now than we've ever been. And quite frankly, um, we are much closer to having a society of abundance, right? And I mean, if you look at really um, some things, I mean, it wouldn't take much to actually create a universal basic income. Virtual progress, and what we mean by this is actually using virtual reality and simulations as a means to better understand different scenarios, to create stronger empathy, and to actually move from I believe this to I can experience this, and I can see using real-time data and simulations the ways in which this may play out. And this gives us an ability to see different possibilities that previously we would not. Community-led data empowerment. This is actually having community data and organizational data more shared and people having it more owned to themselves and being able to use it in ways that they feel is most appropriate. Okay. Um, and smart organizations. Um, these are organizations that actually use data analytics to make themselves not only more efficient and profitable, but also more empowering for its members and more focused on its, the members' well-being. So what does this mean for you? Um, so one, there is ideas of business intelligence, uh, which is broadly defined as a technology-driven process for analyzing and presenting actionable information to help executives, managers, and other corporate end users make informed business decisions. Okay, so the old knowledge is power, Kennard. But there's also a sense of being intelligent about technology and the need for innovation. To actually say, we don't want to just innovate because it's a trend. We don't just want to collect data because that's what everyone's doing. We actually want to know what we can do with it. And we want to know how it can help reinvent and change the ways in which we organize ourselves and the ways in which we assess value. So there are some new ways of working that are emerging. One, alternative forms of ownership. So you're seeing a lot more cooperatives, a lot more community ownership, and a lot more high-tech public ownership. And I think that regardless of where you find yourself, the competitive model of corporate and private organizations is quickly becoming economically outdated. So when my son's 20 years old, whatever economy we have, whoever's in power, you're going to see a lot more of this. He's probably going to be part of a variety of networked cooperative organizations that use collaborative advantage in open source problem solving. Um, we're seeing flexible working, so people being able to work from anywhere. We're seeing boundaryless career in organizations. And we're seeing, again, open source problem solving. So I wanted to say, how can we plan for the future today? Well, one, I want to stress this, the future is not inevitable. It's not something that's already written in the sky. And it's interesting, you know, I remember 
in the 1990s when I studied um, economics and uh, political economy, you would turn on the news and everyone said, globalization is happening and there's nothing we can do to say it. And the only people who are saying that's not true is the people whose theory they were supposedly relying on, which is economists. Kind of saying, no, I mean, you know, this is, there's so many different models that you can use. I fear the same is happening here. So if you ask, if you ask, you know, turn on the news, this is inevitable and this is going to happen. The only people saying no are technologists, real technologists, not uh, Mark Zuckerberg, right? They're saying, actually, there's so many possibilities. We're interested in what, you know, wider society thinks. <coughs> Importantly, how do you make disruptions an opportunity and not a threat? When we think of disruptions, we think of uncertain, we think of unpredictably, we think of scared. What can we do to make people more willing to be risk-oriented? And ironically, that is about creating a more sustainable future in the present. I mean, creating the kind of high-tech public safety nets and feelings of security within organizations that actually makes people want to try new things. And rethinking value for a new economy. It doesn't just mean a triple bottom line, it means rethinking actually how we assess value. And I'll give you two examples of this, right? One, we've already talked about social value, right? What is your digital and social footprint? But also, how much knowledge are you creating? What types of data are you creating? And how are you sharing this? And how is this improving not just your organization, but the wider public. 